Yeah, this, this, this may come back also to the notion of, of spontaneity. I wonder, wonder uh, Freeman and Rupert are listening, but not saying very much. Yeah. Well, I was Why? thinking about baseball. I mean, it is, it, it is probably true that the humans evolved mostly by learning to throw rocks, and, and so baseball may have been very essential. So that seems to, to, to persist in adult life. It's also a wonderful game. For you. <laughs> <laughs> fact, what you, fact, said, you said it. <laughs> but you were thinking the last two hours about baseball, or no, no, <laughs> just no, dreaming. Just now. Hmm. I had a lot of I mean, thoughts we, about what we were talking about earlier, but not so many about fun. I don't want to go back, necessarily. Well, what is your well, conclusion after all oh, what has been discussed the last two hours, for instance, about consciousness? Well, it's just that the starting with this, uh, starting, and we got into the whole thing about internalization, machine metaphors, breaking down into little bits. And my feeling is, you see, that, there's a, that we're leaving huge set things out of the puzzle. They may or may not be related to these, uh, the magic tissue or wonder tissue of quantum theory, which I, I like very much what you said, Freeman, about, you know, Dan may not want it in biology, but physicists deal with it all the time. Um, and my own feeling is that there are huge areas we don't understand about human and animal behavior, implying forms of interconnection and um, causal factors, maybe physical principles, that we haven't yet taken on board. And we're, we're just not going to get anywhere solving this like a jigsaw puzzle with several missing pieces. However long we go on, we're not going to solve it. So my approach is to try and find what these areas might be and design experiments where one could find out more about them. One area, let me just mention one, in the realm of animal behavior, namely the homing of pigeons. Now, nobody knows how pigeons do it. And every seemingly reasonable hypothesis has been tested to destruction. Um, we're now in a position where it's just, it, this seems, I think the, the evidence points to the, there being some completely unknown means by which they do it. Some form of connection between the pigeon and its home that we haven't taken on board in our model making. Don't about like the evidence behavior. of yeah. magnetic particles in the yes. head? And the... Well, this is what's satisfied. It's a pabulum for the last 20 years, magnetism. For the magnetic particles may exist in the head. The pigeons may be able to measure the dip of the magnetic displacement, you know, you displace the north, the needle may, of the compass may dip. Can, yeah. Move them due east or due west, the dip's exactly the same. The magnet won't help them in the slightest, even if they've got one. And... How do you know they're working only on dip? This, well, even yeah. if, if they have a compass, if it's a compass... Maybe it's a compass. All right, give, them a, give you a compass, parachute you into some unknown area. You've got your compass, can you get home? I can get close enough to home until I pick up other signals, which is apparently... Can you, without a map? Oh, I have to know where I am relative to oh, where I've been. Of course, that's the problem. That. Well, How I do you know where you are relative to home? you've migrated there once before. No, I, don't, I, I doubt you could just take a pigeon in an airplane and drop a parachute randomly somewhere. But if you're you talking can, about... You can, you oh, can. This really? was done in the Second really? World War, yes. In the Second World War, pigeons were taken routinely on Lancaster bombers. Uh, from the, the British um, Royal Air Force Pigeon Corps That's supplied these um, <laughs> pigeons. They were taken on Lancaster bombers. And the, the idea was if they were ditched in the North Sea on the way back from a sortie in Germany, uh, then the, the navigator had released the map reference. They put tie it on the pigeons let, and let it go in case radio contact was broken. Thousands of lives were saved by these pigeons. Some were released in the middle of the night in freezing fog, 100 miles from land and they got home. The, the really outstanding ones were awarded medals, and the <laughs> record of these can be found in an amazing book called Pigeons in Two World Wars by Colonel Osman. And um, the, the meritorious performance list has about 500 examples of astonishing feats. They were literally dropped out of planes in the middle of the night, sometimes in the middle of the winter, in freezing fog, and they got home the next morning, and lives were Suppose saved. Suppose that you had a very simple strategy that you flip a coin and you either s uh, fly due west or due east until you hit land. And, and uh, so half of them then will, 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 will come 
uh, would come west and would, would, would ar arrive at England and the other half would arrive in the Netherlands. You have to record the ones that don't make it, which these But they, yes. the point is, they do. They, 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 the first of all, they observe the vanishing the direction. They the point is, the ones that make it get the medals and the other ones you forget about. But in experiments, there's been hundreds of experiments done. You see, every one of these ideas has been tested by serious researchers over long periods. And cloudy days, you know, they've been released on cloudy days. They've been released with their time clock shifted six hours or 12 hours by keeping them in artificially displaced day lengths for weeks. All these pigeons can home. They can home with magnets strapped on their wings or with Helmholtz co coils over their heads. Um, with the blindfolds on? Uh, yes, co frosted glass contact lenses. They've been released up to 200 miles away and they flop down within a quarter of a mile of the loft. Many of them uh, mm -hmm. collide with telegraph poles near the loft, but they, most of them get home to the home regions. And I have a pigeon loft in Britain. And the, the key experiment, you see, all these theories, you know, they see landmarks, the frosted glass contact lenses rule it out, the cloudy days, the time shift, the magnets on their wings. The, every one of these seemingly reasonably remember the way out on the, ho on, on the journey. That's been tested with pigeons anaesthetized, taken in rotating drums by incredibly devious routes. <laughs> when they come round, you release them, they fly straight home. Well, all these theories have been tested. There's been years of research. Factory, is there, is there yes, they've had their nostrils blocked up with wax. They get home. <laughs> they've had uh, <laughs> confusing four, four, smells four, like turpentine put on their beaks. They get home. Oh, and just in case that doesn't work, they've had their olfactory nerves severed. Anosmic pigeons. Those get home. If they, uh, some don't fly at all, because but if you use then to overcome the idea of non-specific trauma. They've had xylocaine sprayed on their nasal mucosa, a local anaesthetic. Those pigeons home straight off with no delay. All the, it's a fascinating literature. For 30, 50 years, 100 years, Charles Darwin suggested the idea in his paper in Nature in 1873 on the origin of instincts, that they remember the way out. And that was the first theory to be tested. Every seemingly rational theory has been tested and tested and tested. And we've now reached a point where all of these have failed. We're in the realm of epicycles now. People are saying, oh, well, it's not any one of these in particular, but knock out two or three, and the others somehow take over in an unspecified combination. Now, my experiment is designed to test this theory to see, I think there's an unknown factor involved. I don't know what it is, but I think the pigeons are somehow linked to their home. So whereas all previous experiments involve moving uh, the pigeons from their home, my experiment involves moving the home from the pigeons. Hence, I have a mobile pigeon loft. And so you can train pigeons to move to a mobile loft. It was done in the First World War with uh, the British Pigeon Corps. It had mobile lofts behind the front line. There's another thing Colonel Osmond's book enlightens one about. They were converted London buses. Um, <laughs> the Japanese had them in the Second World War. I have a fascinating book uh, about the Japanese Pigeon Corps in the Second World War, showing wonderfully Japanese mobile loft somewhere in Manchuria with sort of pointy ends to it. <laughs> <laughs> Oriental <laughs> pigeon loft. <laughs> um, <and coughs> pigeons are cultures of the <laughs> But if you move a pigeon, if you move their home, the first time you do it, you can move it just a hundred yards. And the pigeons are totally confused. They're, even though they can see the loft, they fly around the place where it was for several hours before a brave one goes in, just as we would if we went home and found our home had moved 100 yards down the street. We wouldn't just I'd open the door. To walk you yes. Under any circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> but after a Not while, <laughs> after you've done this three or four times, you can get them to home. And I've <laughs> trained these pigeons up to the point where they could, the loft can be moved four or five miles. And you, you go back, you take them out put them in a box, you tow the loft away, you go back to the first point, you re open the box, release the pigeons, drive back to see when they arrive, and they're sitting on the roof. Well, so far, there's no mystery. This is an area where they could do it by sure. perfectly normal means, fly up in the air, see it. The crucial experiment, I'm so sorry to say, I haven't yet done, because the person I did it with who feeds them and has contracted a disease called pigeon lung, which means he can't go in the pigeon loft anymore. It's like asbestosis. And so I'm sorry to say this is an unended uh, saga, but here is a perfectly reasonable experiment. I think the chances of it working are only about one in 10, because I think you may need to move more of the home than just the loft, even though I leave half yeah. the pigeons in it. But a mobile island, a floating island or a ship, would give one the capacity for moving more of the home. It's an area open, potentially open to empirical testing. 
The budget for this experiment so far has been 500 pounds. Not very much. This is a poor man's sport, and, and so one doesn't need big grants for this kind of work. Here is a real mystery, and you'll find people who'll tell you it, it isn't a mystery, but anyone who actually works in the field and who knows the literature, um, and I've gone into this quite recently in quite a lot of depth, and there's, there is, it's completely unsolved. And so we have this pigeon homing, the homing of dogs and cats, the migration of fish, huge tracts of animal behavior, which have big implications for the evolution of migratory pathways, which can evolve quite rapidly and so on. Large areas are unsolved, and these could have a great deal of relevance to the understanding of faculties of various kinds that we haven't taken into account. This is one example. I have quite a number of others. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you say this is a real 